Good morning. I think I'll get here together yet. I can't see any of you again now after the first service because my wife brought my glasses, so it's good not to see anybody this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, Mark reminded me uh, before we got started here as we were getting some of the stuff set up that I neglected to say something about this, and I don't know, this should not have slipped my mind. Um, I will make sure to announce it at the second service, but for those of you that were at the first service, um, maybe you have heard that uh, Laura Ash had passed away. Her funeral will be on Wednesday at the church at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. So uh, if you would like to join, uh, join us up for that worship service, you're certainly welcome. But I should have announced that this morning. So uh, with that, I think we'll begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to hear your word in any number of words that you give them to us. Lord, use this word to uh, work on our hearts, to work on our minds, and to turn us always, ever back to you through Jesus Christ. Lord, we also give thanks for the life of Laura and uh, those that she came into contact with and blessed. Lord, we pray that you would continue to wrap their family in your loving arms and peace, knowing that you are the resurrection and the life, even Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, I know these are some slides that I, I'm going to try and catch us back up because I got surprise, I got off track a little bit last time. Nobody's surprised by that anymore, are they? I know, I know, it's a real shocker. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move sort of um, beyond the Apocrypha because we spent some time talking about those apocryphal works and what the word Apocrypha means last time. And as I shared with you, Apocrypha is um, our word, those are word, that's a word that describes collected writings, um, not just the ones that can be found in the Roman Catholic Bible, but also writings um, that are beyond that even. And I brought a two-volume work with me last week and shared with you that that has a lot of things that are not included in the, in the scriptures as we know them, and that the, the fundamental baseline or litmus test that we have for something being a part of the Word of God and included in Scripture is that Jesus can be found in it. There is a term for this. I, well, let me pause quick before I just dive right in and start yapping, because that's what I do. Are there any questions about what we had up to this point that anybody would care to ask? From behind your mufflers. <laughs> No? I've stunned you into complete silence. All right. Well, I wanna, I wanna carry on or carry forward from that understanding of, of um, these extra biblical writings, and I wanna show you how this comes into play for us. And um, I shared with you, you know, Luther's quote, I think it was on the previous slide that I kind of blew right through this, that books of the Apocrypha are not held equal to the scriptures, but they are useful and good to be read. And so, um, as I shared with you also last week, we have a good uh, Lutheran resource produced by our publishing house, Concordia Publishing House, that's on the Apocrypha. Um, I think Jeannie was the one that brought in her copy of it and said that she had it and she'd been reading it and working through that study book. If there's some interest in that, I have one in my library. I can check the church library and we could put one or two into stock if you have some interest in reading that as well. Um, <clears throat> Luther, uh, while he said the apocryphal books were good to be read, um, he still had for himself that same litmus test that if Christ was not evident in, in what he was reading, if he could not trace into Christ, then it did not belong in the scriptures. And I, I think this is about where we ended last week when we were together, was I said there were two books that Luther really did not like in scriptures, um, that he preferred to read other books besides them. And I think you guys got it right when I quizzed you with that, that it was the book of James and the book of Revelation. Did you guys all remember that? Okay, is that about where we left by your recollection? Okay, so he didn't like James because James spoke more of works. And I'd like to turn to James chapter 2 with you real quick in your Bibles just to give you a, a sort of a taste of this. Now, you know Luther, you know his story, 
Maybe you don't know his story, but I'm going to assume for the moment that you know his story to a degree. Was a, um, it wasn't that he rejected works, but he, re he rejected works in terms of their being salvific for us. It wasn't by our works. It's not by our works that we're going to be saved, but instead by Christ's works. Okay? So you can imagine, when we're about to read this in James chapter 2, you can imagine why Luther might not like um, the book of James. We're going to start at verse 14, and I'm just going to read a little bit. I've got an ESV Bible. We talked a little bit about that too, but we'll have a little more formal conversation about that, um, hopefully either at the end of today or, or first of next week. James, starting, uh, James chapter 2, starting at verse 14, James writes, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of, one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, if you couple that with, you don't have to turn there, but Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God so that no one may boast. Whoa. This seems like two contradictions, does it not? In Scripture. On one hand, you've got James chapter 2 here telling us faith in and of itself apart from works, will not save you. And then you've got Ephesians 2 that's saying faith is a gift of God, and you can't even engender faith yourself, but it's a gift that comes from God, and it is the cause of your salvation. So which is right? It seems like two ends of the spectrum, does it not? Well, Luther, as you well know, was a big advocate for, um, for what we call... Uh, imputed grace or uh, God's righteousness given to us by gift, kind of like what Paul's writing about in Ephesians 2. So if Luther heard something like this about faith without works is dead, Luther would say, your works are never going to save you. I just came out of that whole system where everything about works was being dumped on us. He was an Augustinian monk, and the, the rigor of monkdom that he was a part of the Augustinian order was the hardest and most rigorous of all of them, adhering to the law, adhering to works, right? And what he discovered in the middle of all that is it's not my works that are going to earn my way to heaven. Remember when I talked about true religions versus false religions? The one true religion differs from all of the false religions in that all the false religions require humankind to serve their God.